Joey, man, thanks so much for coming back on the show here today. Yep. Super excited to have you back on. Could you start by just telling us a little bit about yourself? Uh, my name is Joey Burton. Uh, I'm a basketball skill development coach. Uh, I do work with NBA players, and I focus on shooting because uh, shooting is the separator. Uh, it could take a player from good to great. And uh, I just recently moved to Atlanta. I've uh, been down there just a little over a year. Um, I'm loving the time uh, in the South. Uh, Miss Cindy had a lot of great years up there and uh, built some great relationships that are going to last a lifetime. But this new journey has been exciting, and uh, I'm enjoying you know the, the weather in the winter. <laughs> a <the> <laughs> little yeah. bit different there in Atlanta in the winter yeah. than it is in Indy. So talk to me, man. What's, what's new with you since the last time you were on the show? Obviously, you're in Atlanta now. Yeah. What's changed? Like, what are you into these days? Has has anything changed about what you're doing with your athletes in the last year or two? Yeah, um, a, a lot, I think, has changed. Um, I think, you know, part of uh, being a good coach is growth. And if you look back five years, ten years ago at what you were doing and you say, well, I'm doing the same exact thing um, because it worked then, you're probably not truly growing. And so uh, one of my biggest uh, growths as a coach is to really focus on vari uh, you know, variabilities and workouts, uh, randomness, um, having as much live defenders uh, as possible so that players could work on reads, uh, decision making, and being able to work on spatial awareness, things like that. And so uh, not that <clears throat> what I did 10 years ago was bad, but through growth and, and studying, uh, learning and, and, and skill acquisition, I've come to find uh, more effective ways to do workouts. And so that's probably the biggest uh, uh, thing. And it doesn't mean I always have a defender in a workout, but I could also give cues. I could give, uh, I could give physical cues to indicate what I want a player to react to and how they could react and what are some options uh, to do after I make that verbal cue or uh, physical cue. So that's kind of the biggest change I made in my uh, training. Still a lot of the same principles and, and the same cues, but the structure or the environment of the workout has changed. Yeah, I love that. So what I'd love to do is for people that didn't listen to the first show, maybe like give them a recap on just shooting the ball. And, and if you're a physical prep coach, I promise we're going to tie all this in so you can see how this all kind of intermingles. But I'd love for you to just give us a breakdown because a lot of us too, like, you know, if you're a certain age, like you go out and you play rec center ball, or you want to yep. just go out and get buckets with your kids. So for starters, would you just give us a recap of like Joey Burton's fundamental skills of shooting or like the fundamental tenets of shooting the ball well? Well, with uh, my philosophy and my growth as a coach, you know, some things have changed as well. And so uh, from your your uh, area of, of coaching in the sports uh, science and, uh, you know, sports performance uh, field kind of inspired me to uh, do this change or to kind of change my philosophy. And, and I've really come to the realization that shooting is about three things, positions or, or postures, right? Mm -hmm. And being able to hip hinge, being able to feel the inside of your arches for balance, right? And, yep. and being able to have, you know, proper hand position, all right, on the ball. How are you finishing your shot? What position are you in when you're finishing your shot or when you're on balance? And, and all those are very important and those impact patterns the the movement of the body now so are you loading your hips or get, perform that hip hinge as the ball is coming into your hands is your ball path when you shoot is the ball path in a straight line which will help ensure uh, accuracy right or when you're pushing to shoot your shot are you pushing up rather than at the rim or out and so we got positions that impact patterns and mm -hmm. then patterns will impact performance. And so how do we work on the performance aspect of it is now we're working on live situations. Um, one of the things I would do uh, five, six years ago was just continue to rep out reps 
with a player on these new positions, patterns, right? And the performance was judged by, hey, they're making shots. Well, there was no defense on them, <laughs> and there was no situation where they had to make a decision to even shoot. And so what I've done here in recent years is when I'm working with the player on shooting specifically, once I get the feeling that they grasp these positions and patterns, we're throwing them in live play. And yeah. now it gives me the opportunity to cue and coach and observe what they do when there's a live defender on them. I don't have the uh, I don't have the luxury to be with them at practice, or I don't have the luxury to be with them, you know, on the sideline during a game. So I used to maybe not even get to that for weeks, you right. know. And now it's sometimes after the first workout, sometimes it's after the second or third workout, and being okay with you know, not having the, you know, like have all the answers and all the fixes right away. You know, yeah. um, I think it's important that we spend a lot of time observing and watching these positions and these patterns so that we could get better cues and we could allow for the athlete to really self-correct. Yeah. Dude, one of the things that you mentioned is probably a year or two ago was this idea that shooting is a conscious decision. Mm -hmm. and, and I'd never thought of it like that. I mean, when you play, you realize this, but if you haven't been around the game or you haven't played in a game in a long time, like if you're just going out getting shots up, there is no decision, right? Like I'm going to catch it and I'm going to shoot it. Yep. But in a game, like you said, there's live defenders, there's things going on that you have to interpret. You've got the environment around you. So talk to me a little bit more about that because I think that in and of itself is something that a lot of people have never thought about. Talk to me about either shooting or not shooting being a decision-making moment. Yeah, um, I think that's it, it's crucial. Um, and it's not even shooting or not shooting. It, we Sometimes there's doubt in a player's mind, and doubt isn't like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to make this shot, but there's doubt if I'm going to shoot or not. And you can't create that doubt. Maybe it's a slight hesitation, um, and now a player's, didn't think they were open and they hesitate and they realize they are open. Now they shoot. You can't simulate that without a live defender or some type of uh, cue. Like if I don't have a live defender, maybe an example would be uh, me just tell them the shot that they're going to shoot on the catch. So mm -hmm. now they've shot, you know, a three going left. They've shot a catch and shoot three. And then I, will, you know, pause for a second and they're trying to, you know, listen to what I'm saying on the catch. And then I say three and then they're like, oh, okay, I got to reload my thinking and my decision and shoot it. So right. you can do that a little bit without a defender, but that's an example of what I try and uh, imitate or try to mimic for them in a workout. I was with one of my clients, George Nang, out at his, uh, at his college uh in Ames, Iowa, he went to Iowa State, and uh, he was running a basketball camp, and we'd work out there, and we had uh, the Iowa State managers uh, rebounding for us. And after he did his initial warm-up, I had one of the managers just contest every shot. And one of them at the end was talking to the other one. He's like, man, this guy just did an hour shooting of contested shots. Like, I haven't <laughs> seen that before, you know? Yeah. And, um, and uh, you know, it, it's uh, – you know, it's not always going to be pretty. It's not, you know, the game isn't pretty. It's not always going to be perfect. Um, you know, uh, and it's, the hardest part is probably trying to get players to say, hey, you know what, if we're shooting, um, you know, game-like shots and we're shooting shots with the defender and they're making you have to react and make decisions and maybe get away and your, your balance isn't always going to be perfect, if we could do that and – your percentages drop closer to what they would be like in a game or closer to what we would be very happy with for an end of the season percentage, then we're actually doing a better job than just having you shoot a whole bunch of reps, no defense on. And we're like, man, this guy's making eight out of a hundred th uh, threes. He's getting better. And then, well, why is he shooting 32% from three on the season? Right. So yeah. Players struggle with like, well, I'm not shooting as well as in the workout. It when you know when I'm doing this, and it can get frustrating for them at first. But a lot of times, once they start to see how it translates, and we're building this bridge between the workout and the actual game, they really start to buy in. Yeah. So talk to me about that. Talk to me about 
when it's time to move somebody like we talk about blocked or mm -hmm. like rehearsed practice and random practice, right? Yeah. So blocked is we're trying to just drill the skill. Yeah. When do you know, okay, it's time to move from this blocked, we've got our reps in, they've got the technique, the balance, they're getting the foot position and the drive that they yeah. want to. Now we got to make it random. We've got to add a defender or some cognitive element. When do you move to that kind of stuff? Um, when I, I feel that the players are starting to get to these positions and patterns and they're able to execute the positions or get to these positions and then that impacts the patterns. And once I start to see that, if I see it consistently, it's not, you know, let's just say out of every 10 shots, they have to do it nine times. But if I start to see them consistently doing it, I'm going to jump right into random practice. And another determining factor for me is when they could feel it themselves. So yeah. if they, they've shot one and it was good, right? The exact position and patterns that we want. And then they shot another one and it wasn't, maybe the position wasn't right or the patterns weren't right. And they can immediately say, ah, I need, and they self-correct. Now it's yeah. time to move on. All yeah. Right? I'm not going to, we don't need to sit here and continue to self-correct against air. Now, can you feel it and can you fix it against the live defender? Yeah. I love that. And yeah, I see the I same thing in the gym. This film, but like, I'm really big. If a player could feel what they're doing, then they could fix it on their own. A yeah. lot of times players don't feel it. And maybe in your, your your arena, you know, it's the same thing. If a player could really, you know, or an athlete could really feel, you know, whatever their big, you know, toe, you know, <laughs> playing in the ground or whatever, then they could have a better chance at executing the movement or the exercise that you're working with them on in a much more effective way. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I just think about some of the young, like college guys that you sent our way and how much coaching and cueing it took with them, right? Because yeah. they learned a certain way, or maybe they learned a way that was not exactly the way I would have taught it. How much coaching and cueing it would take them versus a guy like an Ed or a Glenn, mm -hmm. somebody that I've worked with four or five, six years. Do, there's times in, let's say, a lunge or a squat with Ed, I won't say anything. And yeah. after the second rep, he'll fix something, and then he's good. And I'll yeah. just, yeah, you, he knows, right? And so I'm sure it's the same with you. Like, uh, the longer you work with somebody, the more you're hoping that they can self-correct. Yeah. Because like you said, they're not always going to have us in the background to help them. Exactly. And I think it's, it shows uh, it shows maturity of a coach that you could sit there and – <laughs> not say anything and give it some time to see what the athlete could process on their own and then perform on their own. Right. Yep. And you know, that's the hardest thing. If you're a young coach out there is uh, to just sometimes say nothing and just yeah. observe. <laughs> and it, it's so easy to get caught up. And I've been there before where I felt like I had to correct every time after every shot I had to be loud. I had to be communicative with my words and maybe even with, you know, how I was explaining stuff and like showing them. Right. And the, some of the best things I've done for teaching shooting is to say less. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing how that works. Okay. So I have another question that I'm really interested in your thoughts on because I'll give you a, a gym or weight room example first, and then you can take it to the court. So let's say there's a squat, right? And I'm teaching somebody to squat. There are fundamental principles, right? Like I want them fairly upright. I want their knees to go over their toes. But if I ask you or I to squat, right? And we have a, a, a specific movement pattern, then you have somebody like, again, like a Glenn or an Ed, right? Everybody's going to move a little bit different, but there's a technique element that you need. Like I need these principles and then there's a style element, right? Like everybody's unique idiosyncrasies, right? Or things that make them different. How does that play out with you when it comes to shooting a basketball, right? Because there's fundamental things you yeah. want to see, but then there's also elements of, oh, but this guy is just built this way and he's going to do it like this. How does that work for you? Yeah. Um, you know, shooting isn't the same for everybody. Um, they're going to have different, you know, movement patterns. They're going to be able to get in different positions. But I think principles are important and so uh i'll like, give an example um i was just talking to another coach about this if you're to take a hundred players that um were just learning how to play basketball and you taught them how to shoot like 
Clay Thompson. And then you take another 100 players, and then you taught them to shoot like Kevin Durant, who does a you know pretty drastic swing to his left before he gets the ball back to the middle of his body. I would be pretty confident to say you're going to produce more consistent shooters and better shooters teaching players to shoot more like Clay Thompson. Now, is every player going to look like Clay Thompson? No. But what are some of the principles he has? He has a great wide base, right? Yep. He shoots the ball on the dominant side of his body. All right. He's not coming across. His sh- lift path and the way that he lifts the ball is in a straight line, right? He has a great, you know, follow through. He pushes up through his elbow. So the positions might look a little bit different for different players, but those principles need to be the same. And that's what I do with players is that they're not going to have the same exact, you know, everybody's not going to have their elbow directly underneath the ball like I was taught to have. But I'm not really big on a player having, you know, (laughs) the ball's on the right side. Now their elbow's like flared out, right? And so a player might be a little bit outside the ball. A player might be underneath the ball, right? But it's on their dominant side. They're pushing up. They're generating great arc, right? Those are the yep. things that I'm looking for. So I want players, first and foremost, and, and it's the same with what you do, is to feel comfortable, right? Yeah. And they have to feel comfortable. Now, there's a balance there. Like, yeah, it's not going to feel comfortable because you haven't done it before. But right. I'm not going to try and get you in a position, you know, that is uncomfortable. I'll use an example with you. Remember when we spent some time together in the gym and, you know, with your uh, weightlifting competitions or whatever, those (laughs) power cleans, you know, (laughs) like your wrist wrist flexion isn't the best. It's not great. Right? It's It's not not great. great. So I wasn't here trying to like, you know, come on, Mike, you got to get your wrist back. You got to get your hand under the ball. But we had to emphasize pushing up more to generate yep. more arc, right? Um, and I don't know if you remember this, but it might have been when uh, we were at the factory together and I might have showed you the video, but I had a kid that, like, his knees would just go forward when he mm-hmm. would start to load into his shot. And I was like, you have to hip hinge. Um, I, I was giving him stuff that you've given me, like, put your hands, on, you know, stand straight up, put your hands on your thighs, go back like you're tired, you know, yeah. get your hands on your knees, and then now let's lift your chest up. Boom, that's the position. I couldn't get this guy to load his hips at all. And right. I remember, like, showing you the video or maybe sending you a video, and you just, like, responded, like, dude, that guy has no posterior chain. Like, <laughs> like he's all quads. And, yeah. and, I, and I'm sitting here, like, if I didn't know that, and if I didn't um, – and I think we're going to talk about this later, but if I didn't – seek your opinion from a, from a sports performance and a movement, you know, standpoint, I would have been on this. Like, you're not listening. You don't, you know, how, how hard is it? Like, you know, I would be on them and frustrated. And once you told me that this young man needs to work on his posterior chain, it totally impacted my approach on how I was going to help him improve as a shooter. Yeah. It's, it's so interesting. Like, tell you a quick story, but we had this baseball kid that came in and, you know, dad's talking about, Oh, you know, he's got elbow pain. And so Bill's looking at him on the table and the dad is a baseball coach, right? So the the guy knows how to teach the kid how to throw, right? So Bill watches the kid throw and his elbows way down here and his elbow is a whip. Bill does some bill magic, right? (laughs) You know, all of a sudden they go back out. Now he's got his elbow up. He's following through the way that he wants. So the, the dad, the coach was giving him the right cues, but he physically couldn't get in those positions. And it's the same thing here. It's, it's where you can find that balance of, hey, you know, what is this is a skill thing? What of this is a movement based thing? And then being able to collab and work together to kind of find those fixes, I think is super important. Oh, super important. And it's a game changer. It's really a game changer when uh, when, when you could work in unison to help the athlete. So let's just. I was going to save this, but let's just go ahead and go there now. Like when you're working, cause you've worked with a lot of S and C coaches, physical mm-hmm. prep coaches yeah. over the years. And if nothing else, just having those interactions, right. It's not always maybe me or somebody from my fast, but what do you want to see from our end? Like how can we best serve you and help you get the most out of your athletes? 
Um, I think for, for, well, first of all, it's a partnership. So it's not, you know, my job and then is this to do this and this, and then you have to fall in line with me or vice versa. You know, um, I'll use our relationship since it's so close. Um, I just feel like when guys came out of the season, they were healthy and they're just getting back into it. Like I would talk to you about some things that I wanted to see them perform better, you know, yep. like, you know, Ed, uh, even before uh, his injury, it was, hey, we need to really get him to decelerate better. We need to have better balance, right? And so yep. you would devise the plan uh, and your your part based upon what he needed to improve on a- as a player from, you know, speaking with me. But then yep. when he was injured and he's coming off his injury, I'm talking to you about what's going on. And now I'm devising the plan on the court according to what you saw in the weight room and what he, and and what he could handle and what he could do. And so that's like a balance that, Hey, we're both on the same team. And you know, if he's coming off an injury, that's not my specialty. So I'm going to listen to what you have to say and what he needs to be doing based on your wisdom and your knowledge. But the guy is healthy and you don't know like, Hey, this guy, could really get better at, you know, performing and get a little more distance on maybe a Euro step. Or if he could stop immediately on the first step that he stops on this first step, rather than having to take that second step just to gain a little balance, right? You're not maybe necessarily seeing that and knowing how we're going to add that into his game. But from the functional standpoint, you could help with that process. So I think this just starts with being a uh, partnership and then Um, also, uh, you know, asking and being willing to ask questions, right? Asking questions and just like, I didn't know why that kid couldn't keep, you know, why he couldn't (laughs) load his hips. And I asked you, I was humble enough to say, I don't know. I don't know. And just like, I think any good coach, um, you know, is, is we're, we're always trying to discover, right? We're always trying to look into something and discover more and how could we do it better? How could we, uh, uh, know more about it? And there's a lot of great minds out there. And if you're willing to say, I don't know, now you're going to open yourself up to learn and ultimately help the athlete. And just because, you know, you're, you're not a, you're, you're not a basketball guy and you didn't have all this, you know, years of playing basketball doesn't mean that you can't help a basketball player become a better basketball player. And yeah. just like me, I'm not in the sports performance and you probably know more about basketball than I know about sports performance, but you could see, or, or you come to me and ask questions because you want to learn more about the teaching methods and, and, and what we're trying to accomplish on the court. And that's where it's just a partnership. Yeah. I love that. And I wrote down two things. Number one, I think you said it, but maybe not as directly as I'm going to like putting your ego aside. Yep. And I think this gets easier as you get older. Yeah. Right. We're both 20 plus years in. Yeah. If you're 22, 23, you want to put your stamp on everything. Right. Yep. If I'm the strength coach, man, we got to get this guy strong and whatever. If you're the skill developer, oh man, we're going to get you on the court. The longer you do this, the easier it is to set your ego aside and realize it's not, it's not about either of us. No, really. It's about the athlete. So that's number one. And then number two, I think one thing that's always been great about us is neither of us is has an issue getting uncomfortable. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So like I have no issue coming to you on the court and saying, why are you doing that? Like, mm-hmm. what are you working on? Like trying to better understand your process and same thing. You know, you'll say, hey, why are you doing with that with that guy in the gym? Yeah. So having those conversations and being uncomfortable getting outside of like your silo yeah. Right. Me getting out of the weight room and coming on the court and you vice versa. I think that's what's allowed us to have such great success over the years. Yeah. And, and it's just a synergy, right? You're just, Hey, yeah. I'm in the weight room. I'm, I'm watching sometimes and, and I'm, I'm in, uh, you're on the court, you know, uh, when I'm, you know, with my clients, if they're on, uh, the, uh, you know, I'm traveling with them. I've watched every weight session that they do because yeah. I want to yeah. learn. I want to know what right. they're doing. And it's not, because I want to hover over the coach many times I'm getting my own lift in. So I'm not yeah. hovering over the workout, but it allows me to observe some of the things that they're doing 
And now I could ask questions, not why, because I don't think that's a good exercise, but why are you doing this? So now I can see how it relates to on the court because I yeah. really, um, I really think a lot of uh, coaches on the court would be amazed at, you know, something that doesn't look like it's really would translate to basketball that if you really found out why and the why behind it, you've got, ah, oh, that translates to basketball. Oh, actually it translates to everyday movement, <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. They can move better in all areas of their life. And that will make a better basketball player. I love it. Okay. So something else I really wanted to ask about was what changes as an athlete develops? Cause I've seen you work with everything from like little middle school age kids to we're talking, you know, multi-year NBA veterans. Yeah. What changes as you continue to work and progress with an athlete? Uh, what, what, what changes as far as <laughs> from different levels? Uh, could you, yeah, like level to level, like once somebody has a base, right. And yeah. you're taking them for, like, is it the amount of detail? Is it specific right. elements of their yeah. game? Like, what are you yeah. changing? How, how is the workout evolving yeah. from little um, Johnny's trying to make the team to, yeah. no, you're George Yang and you're in the NBA. Yeah. Those are early ages. We're just trying to build a foundation of good habits, right? A foundation mm -hmm. that they could be in position to perform, you know, as they get older. So the yep. understanding and, and being able to execute, you know, certain fundamental actions, you know, being able to have the ability to drive left when you need to drive left and drive right when you need to drive right, having the ability to come to a jump stop and then play with pivots, right? Those are all yep. things that are foundational. Well, as an athlete gets older, those things are still foundational, but now the time to get to those things is a lot less, right? You don't have maybe three or four dribbles to get past your defender like you might have had <laughs> when you were in high school. So things have to be, like decisions have to be made faster, right? Yeah. When you get there and you get to where you go, now there might be more problems, meaning that, oh, I in, in high school, I just blew by the guy and nobody was able <laughs> to rotate over. Now I got a seven-footer rotating over, and now on the weak side, I got a guy dropping, covering two, and I don't know, do I shoot the floater? Do I go into the defender? Do I kick it? So a lot of the speed of the game and then the physicality of the game changes, but if you have that foundation and you continue to, to build on that foundation, you're going to have a good chance if you have the physical tools to compete at the level that you're going to compete at. Now, like we have guys that have had different physical tools, right? Like George doesn't have these physical tools <laughs> that jump off the TV screen and you're like, wow, right. that guy is so good and so fast and so explosive. But that's where understanding – roles that's where understanding what is the player being asked of or is being required to do now can we find ways to allow them to perfect and be masters at what they do in those situations that are required of them yeah i love that something else that i don't think most like common fans know or understand so like Again, I'll go to a different sport first. In soccer, in soccer, the goal is to control the ball, right? When you're first starting off, if little Johnny can kick it from one end of the field to the other, all the parents are like, oh, it's awesome, right? When you get older, kicking it to the other side just gives it back to the other team, right? right? So you play it to a teammate. You want to possess the ball. In basketball, a lot of times I think people think everything is an and one mixtape, yeah. right? So somebody's handling the ball, 20 dribbles. You and I both know. That's not how basketball is generally played, like every right. now and then. So talk to us about how like the speed of the game impacts decision making and also just how, hey, man, just because it looks cool in a mixtape doesn't mean it's going to carry over to a real life game. Because, you know, I know you do a lot of stuff where it's like, hey, you get one dribble, two yeah. dribble. You have to make a decision quick. So talk to me more about that. Well, the, I mean, the basis of good basketball uh, is good decision making and being able to make the right decisions. There's been a lot of athletes that are 
elite, but they never been able to, uh, you know, have, make good decisions on a consistent basis. And many times, like you said, uh, you know, when <clears throat> that young kid was able to cook, kick the ball to the other side of the field, <clears throat> you know, that's one thing I think I'm hurt. I think is hurting basketball. Right now. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's hurting basketball right now. Is this? It's, it's starting at such a young uh, age, and you got second grade, um, you know, travel basketball, right? And and you see these kids, and yeah, they're big for a second grader. They're fast and you know, the development it happens early for them. Yep. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that's going to translate to elite level success. And, you know, so making those quick decisions and being able to uh, have the ability and the foundation to know how to play sometimes happens later in life. And it also happens sometimes when you grow physically right? You mature. Um, that's yeah. one thing I, uh, just, it, it continues to, you know, boggle my mind. I'm like, man, this, this young kid is 14. I don't know. I don't know. 16 years old. I'm working with them so much more mature and yeah. just maturity, just growing older, help them play better, you know? Yeah. And so, um, you know, it's an evolution process, but yeah, I see it all the time in basketball, especially you see these younger kids and, um, you know, I, I, my son's playing football and, you know, what I was concerned about is that they're going to, you know, just look at size or, you know, you know, look at, you know, you know, oh, this kid's really fast. So he must be the running back or, you know what, <laughs> whatever, and not teach these young players just how to play football. You know, yes. and I had to meet with like the director and just say, hey, how is this organized? Because I don't want my son to be thrown at, you know, defensive linemen and that's all he plays. And he's not probably going to be a defensive lineman. You know, he's right. going to be tall, he's probably going to have a lean frame. If anything, he might be a tight end if you wanted to continue to play. But, you know, just throwing a player in because of size or because of early skill and saying, well, they're going to be really good. It's just, uh, it's detrimental to their growth and it really sets them up and many parents up for, uh, uh, failure and unrealistic, uh, uh, unrealistic like expectations. Yeah. I, I think this is true in almost every sport right now, right? Like the, the commercialization of sports, the yeah. travel sports environment, like, Oh, little Johnny's eight. He's a shortstop. Well, you know, that's great, but, Little Johnny should probably learn outfield and first base and second base. Just like, you know, if you've got a young kid playing basketball, hey, teach them to handle the ball, teach yeah. them to shoot, teach them post moves. Cause you don't know. Like, that's really the thing, don't. right? Like, you can look at the parents and get some inkling, but you really don't know what these kids are going to grow into. So, like, and let them try everything. In, in all my years of experience and working with NBA guys, most of them were late bloomers. I mean, I yeah. worked with the player that uh, was on the Hawks this past season. And he uh, he literally didn't play travel basketball on like one of the circuits. Uh, he played on the Under Armour circuit until his junior summer. And oh my he gosh! Went on, he went on to play at Rhode Island. Then he transferred to UConn, and uh, he, he, he graduated the year before. You know, the year before they won the championship this year, and he was a second round pick. There, there's players that were ranked top fifty when he was still playing local AAU tournaments <laughs> that right. never have stepped foot in the NBA, you know, Jaron Jackson yeah. jr. Who's, you know, spent time in Indianapolis, you know, I had him in eighth grade. He wasn't even, he was the third best player on the team. And there was more times than not, I didn't know if he was going to, you know, make a layup or not, you know, <laughs> right. And, and uh, nothing was rushed with him. Nothing was, you know, put pressure on him. He, you know, he, didn't play high level AU basketball to like after his sophomore year, you know, yeah. and he goes on and becomes a top five pick in um, the NBA draft after his freshman year. And so uh, I just, man, I see it all the time and, you know, and it's tough now. I being a parent, now I have a son in sport. You yeah. know, I'm not going to say that I'm mightier than anybody else or I'm better. Than, like it's, it's tough to, you know, 
want to balance that. You know, I want, I don't want to be like that. And I have to sometimes keep myself in check or my wife keeps me in check. You know? <laughs> yeah. None of us are, um, you know, immune to getting caught up in what youth sports is and, and wanting the instant success, even as coaches. And, and we like to talk about it a lot as coaches is like, Oh, it's not that important, but our competitive juices start to flow and, yeah. you know, our parent hat goes on and we are success, susceptible to doing the same thing that we sometimes look down upon. Yeah. No, I couldn't agree more. The thing that, that I always come back to with my kids and I'm there with you, dude. I'm there with you. Like the competitiveness and the drive, um, it's all instilled. The thing that I always come back to, the two things, are they are they developing, right? The level yep. they're at, are they developing? Are they getting better? And number two, are they having fun? Yeah, yeah. And if you can check those two boxes consistently, then I think you're on the right track. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, yeah, you know, Malachi. I mean, my son does look like Patrick Mahomes. And yeah, he has he does. a little cut like Patrick Mahomes, right? Yeah. And so people have been telling him that since he's been like five or six years old. So of yep. course, what does he want to do? He wants to play quarterback. And I'm like, of course. It's not about playing quarterback, and actually, you don't have enough football experience to play quarterback right now because there's no coaches on the field. You got to, right. you know, like, as far as like inside the play, they all have to be on the sideline. So I said, you don't yep. know enough about um, uh, football. But part of me wanted to be like, yeah, why can't he get a shot at you know quarterback? You know, and right. all I ask, and I and I talked to the coach about this, is I said all I ask is that you know in Another thing I'm learning with youth coaches: practice structure. I want good mm -hmm. practice structure. You know? Yes, yes. Um, like I, you know, and I, you know, and uh, the coaches uh, for our son are great, great encouragers. I believe they are good teachers. They're they're just um, bring great energy. But the practice structure, I actually had to talk to them because there's 16 kids in one line. Like the whole yeah. team is in one line doing the drill, and we got four or five coaches. Like, let's break that up. So that's yeah. the whole thing. You said development, and I think that goes along with development. But I want good practice structure because yeah. good without good practice structure, it's going to be a hard to have good development. Yeah, I love that. Uh, I I stole this from the the soccer uh, program that Kendall and Kate have gone through. But they said no to the three L's: no lines, long lines laps and lectures that's great that's great. for young that. kids i was like dude that is so money oh, and yeah. so i've stole that ever since yeah i'm still in that too <laughs> okay a couple more things yeah. and then we'll start to wrap this up so what i want to talk about are some of what i would describe as the non-sexy markers of physical performance right so people love to talk about speed strength power conditioning you and i've had some great discussions the last couple of weeks about non-sexy things one being balance yeah right specifically when it comes to shooting a basketball so talk to me about balance in shooting why it's important and maybe some things that you're looking at to help somebody achieve better balance uh i think balance is uh important um but i think balance comes uh partly out of randomness um and what i mean by that is you're not always going to be able to know exactly when you're going to stop. And mm -hmm. so if I'm giving you a predetermined time or a predetermined amount of dribbles, let's say, until you stop, it's going to be easier to achieve balance. But within yep. the chaos of basketball and of, a, of a, a game that flows like basketball, you're not going to always have this ability to predetermine when you're going to stop. And that's where I start to judge balance. You know, not mm. when a player could uh, predetermine something and then, or I tell them what to do and then they stop and they're like, great shot, like, everything's on balance. It's when I put them in random situations or something that I'll do is just have players, you know, in some ways sometimes just start speed dribbling. And I'll just say, hey, you're going to speed dribble from half court when we work on balance, from half court all the way to the rim for a layup. But if I say shot, you have to come to a stop immediately I love that. and then get yep. into your shot. So I want them thinking speed, downhill, but also be aware they might have to stop. Now mm -hmm. I could judge if a player has good balance or not. And yep. then through that, talking with you, like 
teaching players how to, you know, get their heel to the floor and you got to find your heels to stop. You know, I didn't know that before I uh, met you. And so yeah. um, putting them in situations, uh, a big thing, uh, coaches, you might see now on uh, social media is players like part of their warm up. They're hopping maybe from one leg to another leg, you know, single leg hops. And I'm all for that. Um, I think uh, my my what I like to do that for is it really eliminates your lower body and it forces you to push through your elbow, which I'm a really big believer in. And so, so many players tend to use too much legs to try and generate power and it could be a, de a detriment to them. But um, mm -hmm. so if they're, let's say they're just doing these like, uh, you know, lateral jumps off of one leg side to side, I'm not going to tell them, go, hey, jump from right to left and then left to right and shoot. I'm going to let them jump side to side. And then when I say shot, that next leg that lands, they got to gain their balance, you know, and now talking with you, find their arch and get, you know, pressure on the inside of their foot so that they could stop on balance and then go into the shot. And so those are some of the things that I'm starting to really uh, implement into the workouts that maybe I didn't do, you know, five, six years ago because uh, balance is an important part. But also, I think that is an, or another important aspect of balance is as you're gaining balance, can you still execute when the balance isn't perfect? And mm. now, how do we find ways to do that? And so that's sometimes, the, the I think, the trick to balance is you're not going to always ha get perfect balance. I mean, hey, if you're shooting, running a certain speed and there's a guy chasing you, right, you're you're not going to be able to just stop on the dime and come to right. a complete stop. So, but Go you, straight up yeah, and down. You can go straight up and down. But just because you don't go straight up and down doesn't mean you have bad balance either. And meaning, mm. you know, because we think of balance as always being, you know, Vertical, like land, land in a square, yeah. right? And, Jump and, and, and land and in I a think square. Balance too, and maybe I'm wrong when I say this, but balance. If you if you start with a good balance, you you might be drifting a little bit, but if you start with good a good balance and you have uh, good feet, that helps you get good balance, right? It allows you for better body control while you're in mm -hmm. the air. Yeah, does that make yeah. sense? And that so, makes perfect. So sense. a lot of guys. Because they'll kick their leg around, right? And, and players will kick their leg around. Why did they have to kick their leg around that far? That that far? Why? They didn't start with good balance. Didn't mean that they had to mm -hmm. jump straight up and down. But good balance many times leads to better body control in the air. Mm -hmm. I like that a lot. Okay. Talk to me about rhythm in shooting. Because, again, nobody talks about rhythm, right? Like, I don't know how you measure rhythm yeah. unless you take somebody to the club and, you know, see what they can do on the dance floor. But, like, when it comes to rhythm, one of the things that I know you talked about, too, you'll see some people that are coached to, like, start in that, like, set position yeah. and then go straight up from there. I know I was taught that. Yeah. And then you were like, I actually don't love that. Yeah. And you were talking about how actually starting up maybe a little bit higher, then dipping, and then going. So talk to me about how that might actually help somebody shoot more effectively. Well, um, rhythm, I think, is important because it generates, helps generate power, right? If, yep. if you, um, you know, let's just say you start low, your first, your, your first um, uh, motion, if you start low, is still going to be going down. Now, how yeah. low is too low to generate more power? Um, <clears throat> you know, we don't tell players when they catch lobs to start with their hips down. <laughs> right. right and so um why why would we why would we do that with shooters as well and so um you know i i like just a simple teaching point of like load on the catch so that you can explode and i use this analogy maybe this could help some coaches out there uh is that you could still explode without jumping as high as you can Right. Oh, yeah. And so, yeah. so like if we had um, these pads on the floor and then the first step of a bleachers had another pad and we were able to measure how fast you got from the floor to the first step of the bleacher. Right. I'm not going to try and jump as high as I can, but I still have to explode. And so right. you, this is in your area of like maybe, you know, when, when you go down, I mean, what is that force you're generating? You're building force if you go down. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. So, yeah. So, I would rather 
start a little bit higher and now I have more room to generate more force, which will help right. me explode up. And yeah. now that upward explosion explosion gives me more power, but also helps me generate more arc. And as you probably could already tell, I love arc. And so right. um, that's what I want. So, uh, and, and when you do that with fluidity, it just makes everything so much um, more consistent. And yeah. the other thing is, is uh, that, you know, sometimes when you start to get low and then you get too low, I mean, I, I see it just tenses players up. Like I want, I want players just, to, you know, not standing, you know, I, your phrase, relaxed knees, right? Yeah. Because relaxed knees, you know, and, and th- these are just details that I've learned from your arena that, it, you know, makes so much sense. I was like, this could just be transferred to shooting, you know, right. But just have relaxed knees. But when you, Get that ball in your hands. That ball's getting in your hands. You're driving your body and your momentum down slightly, or your hips are, you know, going back and they're hinging slightly. So now you can explode, and it's like just a down up movement rather than a lot of guys that start low. They don't even realize by the time they start low, when they catch it, sometimes they'll go up to go down. And now, yeah. now we're really messing up with uh, fluidity. And then you know, we're, you know, when you have rhythm. Uh, your, your your muscles are more explosive. Everything's able to you know connect better. Um, and everything's flowing together. Uh, when we don't have great rhythm, you send, you tend to get tense, and then tense muscles are not explosive muscles, and now you're in trouble. Yeah, I just remember. I think this is when we are in the trenches, and I think you said something to the effect of, you know, I've seen guys that don't have great mechanics that are at least still smooth and fluid and they shoot the ball pretty well. Mm -hmm. But it's very rare somebody that, you know, if they've got like a herky-jerky shot, it's almost impossible to get them to shoot the ball consistently because they're just all over the place. It's so erratic. Yeah, yeah, and and that's that's so true. Um, You know, I if if I had to like just pick one or two things of what I would want to play, like you can't change your mechanics. Uh, The first one would be arc. I I want to generate more arc. And the second thing is... How could we, I can't change the mechanics, you know, but how could we make them more fluid and have more rhythm? And, and, yeah. and a lot of times we, when maybe the average, you know, well, person thinks of rhythm, they think of like all made shots, like consecutive made shots. Like, oh, they're in rhythm. You know, no, right. we're not talking about rhythm of makes and, oh, this player's in a great rhythm right now. We're talking about the movement patterns of their body going into yep. the shot. Yeah, I love it. Okay, one more, and then we'll do our lightning round. So you and I had this great discussion the other day about developing your coaching eye. Yeah. And I love talking about this. It's something I've talked about with basically every intern, every young coach. How do you go about developing your coaching eye, whether it's in the gym, in the weight room, or on the basketball court? Um, the first thing for me – when I was in college, I was working with some youth basketball players trying to help them get better. You know, I was <laughs> working with them on shooting. Um, uh, I went to this uh, small Christian school, and we we, pro- uh, we partnered with a, a program that uh, worked with uh, inner city kids and these housing projects. And so they would come out over on Monday nights, and we'd play basketball. And I would see some of them shoot, and I was like, yeah, I want to be able to relate to them a little bit better. So I would sometimes – work with them on their shooting and it wasn't good because I didn't really know what I was doing but it's just <laughs> off reading the book. But you know, that honestly like started me just seeing more shooting. And then I started to watch more. Then I started to study more shooters, right? Just every time I watch a game, I just I'm intrigued by shooting. So every shot that I watch in a game, I kind of judge it a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, oh yeah. Oh, what could have been better done better or, you know, you know, I'll see a player's like follow through, go off to the right, and uh, the ball clanked off to the right. So, uh, starting as early as you can, I think, is yeah. important. And it doesn't mean that you're you're going to have everything right. You know, when you're starting, and uh, that's why I think, as a young coach, jumping into youth sports is huge. It's huge yeah. to developing your coaching eye. I know with. Um, social media and now we have more access to information with coaches at a higher level we feel like we could be prepared more 
at an earlier age to maybe go impact a pro or go impact, um, impact a high-level college player or high school player. But there's still nothing wrong with developing your coaching skills with a junior high uh, player. And so I say that because – my success as a, a shooting coach with NBA players wasn't because of the time I spent with NBA players. It was a year and a half to two years of me only working with sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. And yeah. that developed a coaching eye for shooting. But it also allowed me the freedom to develop strategies or develop some solutions to the problems I would see. And then when I start to say, okay, when this player does this, now I – uh, and, and I implement this uh, correction, it works with this player. Oh, it works. Now oh, I see it worked with like six different players. So yeah. now I could look for that in a player's shot. So now fast forward and now I get a chance to work with NBA players and they're shooting the ball a lot of times the same way they shot it in what? Six, seventh, eighth grade. Seventh, eighth grade, you know? yeah. And so now I developed an eye for this with youth, not because I spent more time in the gym with NBA players. And right. so uh, starting, start, you know, starting young, then um, developing the eye through, you know, just working with youth. And then also, you know, I don't know in your field, but just um, tons of film study in my field of basketball, just consistently watching film. And I like to do it in the sense of like not watching the whole game, but like just yeah. pick one area of the game that you want to learn and watch that one area it might just be like hey i want to study steph curry so what i'm going to do is i'm going to watch for an entire game it's hard to do if you're a fan but just watch yeah. steph curry that's the only person you're watching the entire game you're just watching steph curry you could develop your a detailed eye by just watching one thing rather than watching yeah. the whole right and yeah. then uh the, the third thing i would say is you know, doing things like you're doing with, you know, watching and listening to podcasts, see what, you know, uh, coaches that are, have mastered, uh, the, the, the profession of, that you're in, you know, someone like you to, you know, what are they doing? And then that's why I love your, your videos on Instagram because you are cueing and you're teaching as you're, uh, you know, as you're showing your exercises. And now you could start to see, ah, okay. When he says this, I see that now I need to be looking for that in athletes, you know, so don't, right. be a, don't be too big or afraid to just start with youth because I think that's the biggest thing is hours, right? How many yeah. hours can you have in a detail, you know, to develop that detailed eye? I am um, kind of a quick story. Uh, I, I coached at Mississippi state with the women's team and one of the assistants at Mississippi state, um, uh, two years after I was done there, became an assistant at West Virginia. And she uh, saw that I was in skill development. I was in my second year in Indianapolis. And I, uh, uh, she said, hey, would you come in and talk to the coaches about skill development for, like, we'll fly you in, um, you know, like on a Wednesday night. Well, you'll be with us all day Thursday and then, you know, fly back Friday morning. I was like, yeah, I would love to do that. I was excited. You know, it was a great opportunity. And so – I, you know, do my presentation and, and, and I'm talking to him and we had a break at lunch and she's like, Joey, man, this is, this is really good. She said, I, I didn't know you were like, you know, this detailed with skill development. And, <laughs> and I, and I said, Oh, I wasn't, I, I wasn't like that. But for the last year and a half, I've been doing actual skill development workouts for like 30 hours a week. I'm like, right. what you do in a week for skill development, I do in a day. Uh huh. Yeah, that's why I'm getting better. Yeah, you know. And, yeah, and so, uh, you know, don't, don't, you know, you know, I, I always say this, and I, I mean, I still try and live to this uh, or live this principle is like I, I hardly ever say no to a workout um, uh, that I feel like could make me a better coach, and, and I try yeah. to be more selective with that. kids getting older and all. But when I when I first started, if you were seven years old. Or if you're a 24 year old washed up college player that was hoping to still go overseas, I'm working with you because yeah. every workout is an opportunity for me to, you know, learn that you know detailed eye or to develop that detailed yeah. eye. What's your thought? 
dude, how many free workouts did we give oh, the year we were in the trenches? Tons. Or or at like, least at least uh heavily discounted, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean and this is why, right? The what I wrote down was there's no fast track to this. Yeah. Right? Exactly. There's no hack. There's no way to like get around this. You can't read your way out of this. Like you have to put in the time, you have to put in the reps. So what I tell strength coaches, like let's say you want to work in the NBA, right? That's great. When you're starting off and you're training people, train anybody. Yeah. Train the 12 year old little kid that's never played a sport, train the 75 year old retired person that's got a knee replacement, right? Like have this amazingly wide base because you see so much, you have so many experiences you see so many different things. Like now when it's time to go and work with that high level athlete, it's like, this is easy, dude. Yeah. <laughs> this is easy. They're relatively healthy. They move well. They respond well to queuing. Like it makes it makes it so easy for you. So the same thing in your case, right? Yeah. Teaching a sixth, seventh, eighth grade kid with a limited time, you know, like a limited attention span, limited physical awareness. If you can teach that kid how to shoot pretty well, you can probably teach an NBA athlete how to shoot pretty yeah, well. Yeah, and I think that's the... Um... And I think young coaches, they it's the opposite. They think the opposite. They think it's like, mm. oh man, a six, seven, eighth grade, that's too easy. The the NBA yeah. guy or the professional athlete, those are gonna be the tough ones to to do. But the thing I'm thankful for is I allow that, you know, time to happen. Now I, I would have taken an NBA guy if I would have been still working with those kids. I would have taken an NBA guy right in the middle of it, don't get me wrong. But sure. I'm glad it didn't happen looking back because, you know, as you know, man, you got one time or to make that first impression with the yeah. NBA player or a professional athlete that is going to pay yeah. millions of dollars. And if you tell them something and it doesn't work or you tell them something and it's not it's not right, man, you might not ever see that guy in your gym again. And so yeah. uh, the the. Like you said, it takes time. You can't rush it. It has to be developed, and, and uh, you know, being willing to, you know, I, like I said, you know, don't say no to workouts. You know, wh whatever type yeah. of athlete it is, you know, especially when you're starting off, because you know, I don't want to say this uh, arrogantly, but like it gets easier the longer you do it, right? In the sense yes. of like I, I had an NBA player in from with Orlando Magic, and he wanted to work a little bit on his shooting and like it literally took me just him doing shots around the perimeter one time around the perimeter to address exactly what he needed, you know, and yep. then we start doing it and he starts to see instant results. And he's like, man, this is crazy. Like I've never shot like this. and I'm <laughs> making just as many shots in, as that I am if I wasn't shooting it, right. Or, or, yep. or I was shooting like this. And um, that to have the confidence to know exactly what it was wasn't developed w with NBA players. It was developed right. with youth, and then then it was able to be um, I don't want to say tested, but it was able to be like proven true. And these principles work with the NBA players. Yeah, I love it, man. All right, dude. Lightning round. All right. Okay. Four fairly short questions. Your answer can be as long or short as you All like. Right. Number one. This actually comes from G, our boy G Lim. G wants to know if you can help him shoot like Glenn. <laughs> I do have, Bro, you kept a straight face yeah, longer than dude, I thought. That dude has some huge hands. Uh, <laughs> wrist, wrist flexion uh, might be might be tough. minus ten. And um, I, 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 you need to ask him next time you see him about the time uh, we were in Golden State and how this guy was passing. <laughs> Has he ever told you that story? <laughs> Bro, I saw the video. Oh my! I saw the God. video of G passing. <laughs> the hand, his hand <laughs> swallowed the ball. It would be like me and you. Would, I mean, his hands are so huge. It wouldn't, it wasn't be like me and you shooting on a Papa shot. It's smaller yeah. than that. And then not having the wrist flexion to be able to like properly extend the ball and create the right type of spin to have a pass. Uh. His pass was going all over the place. But, oh uh, my I, gosh. Would, I, would, I would give him my all. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay. Number two. Uh, keep in mind, this is a, a PG-ish rated show. Yep. I think it was Tim. A guy named Tim Mannix wanted to know, what's your funniest George Yang story? Tim Mannix. Uh, 
the funniest George Niang story, man. There is, uh, there is so much, so many of them. Um, here, he just shared one with me today. So we're in Philadelphia, and we're we're uh, we're in the gym, and we're walking in, and uh, the Morris twins, uh, Marcus and Markeith Morris, oh, yeah. uh, they're uh, working out in the weight room, and so. Uh, we get done with our workout and uh, George wanted to go use the weight room and they had a, they had like uh, some, other, some other pros and like college players. And it was like this big group, like group workout stuff that they were doing. <laughs> and so uh, <laughs> George goes in there to see what, you know, how long they're going to be. And, you know, and now I'll get to this point. This in one of the games, George <laughs> and one of the twins, I think the one that plays for the Clippers were like, kind of got like in a little like shoving match or something. And uh, so George is going in there talking to them and, you know, trying <laughs> to see what they're doing. So then he walks out and uh, he's like, man, uh, uh, th- th- those dudes are like two big dudes. He said, I just remember <laughs> when I was uh, going at him uh, and he was like, you know, calling me all types of names. He said, man, you're not going to get no brownie points for beating me up. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, like, he was like, "Oh yeah, you're right. You're right about that." And just chuckled. So like, he went from like cussing him out to saying, yeah. "Like, you're not gonna get no brownie points for beating me up. No one's gonna respect that." And so I thought he just told me that today. That was funny. Another uh, kind of a funny story would be, uh, so uh, I think it was George his first year in Utah. He um, was playing the Clippers. And he uh, sprinted down the court um, in transition to try and, uh, you know, stop a layup. And it was Pat Beverly. And Pat Beverly went up there to dunk it. And George goes up and he actually gets it. And he gets the block, right? And it's like, oh, uh-huh. what a play. Well, <laughs> for a gift, somebody, somebody uh, got the picture, like, right before George was about to block it. So the picture, like, if you know the play, you're like, oh, that's an awesome picture. But you're not sure if he got dunked on or if it was a block. But you're probably not going to hang up a poster of you getting postered, right? Right. So Pat Beverly just signed here in Philly uh, this offseason. <laughs> <laughs> so he came and looked at the apartment that George is living in and showed him the room. And that picture <laughs> was hanging up. And Patrick Beverly was like, yo, what the F is this? Well, like, who's this guy, you know? And so, uh, and like, total, like, weird timing. Like, George had it up. Didn't know that Pat Beverly was going to be looking at the house. George was, like, way yeah. out in L.A. And uh, then I guess the owner called it George. Like, yeah, Pat was like, so, you know, who is this guy? Like, he has a picture of him blocking my shot, you know? It was, it was pretty funny. Oh, that's good stuff, well, man. Come on, Mike. You got one. You've been around George enough. Oh, dude. Oh man, nothing I can repeat on air. <laughs> I mean, nothing I can repeat on air, dude. He's he's just oh my gosh, he's just comedy. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, it's not a funny story, but I will tell you this: when George was in Indy, right, yeah. and he came, he he had that summer where he was here for like a month straight. It took all of two sessions for George to know everybody in our yeah, gym. that's him. Like anybody that trained at three or four, he knew. And, oh, this is funny. Okay, so, like, that's when we first got the spike ball nets. Yeah. So, you know, we're going there playing spike ball, and it was mostly Ty. You remember Ty? Yeah. I mean, Ty's with the Wizards yeah. now, so yeah. shout out to Ty. Yeah. Ty's in there. He's got his high school kids, and there was this high school chick, Maria. She was a beast. She would, like, she was so competitive. And I remember her and George straight going at it in spike ball. I'm like, I don't know if she even knows that this guy plays in the NBA. And he sure as hell didn't care she was in high school. He was giving her the business. Like, yo, what up? I'm killing you. I mean, he was just so intense. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know George, most, but it was hilarious. hilarious. Dude. It's so fun. Okay, number three. Approximately how many little Joey juices did we drink during the 2020 NBA draft? Oh, man. <laughs> that, was, uh, that was a good night, man. Uh, uh, I, I feel like we were kind of just off to the side. I mean, we're at an NBA we were. draft party with 20-year-olds. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that – I've been, not felt outside, older in my entire the, life. Outside of the family, immediate, like, family that was there, um, I think we're the only people there that had kids. <laughs> 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 Bro, it was fun though. Man, it was fun. Man, we had our moment. I, 
I don't even think we were watching the picks, and we were like, "Did he get picked yet? Did he get picked no. yet?" You know, we it, it, we didn't have to watch it because Shams and Woe. Oh yeah, that's right. They they, they ruin everything. Yeah, we were yeah, just following we had, it on we Twitter. Following it, man. That was yeah. That was uh, that was a fun night, and then we went back to the Airbnb. I remember uh, where you where you you might have left already, <laughs> but uh, like one of the assistants uh, for the agency, like she. Uh, just brushing her teeth. Do you remember that? And the whole thing just came out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I do remember that. And all you hear is like, That's... oh, shoot. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I, I come down the stairs and I just see this, the whole, the whole, the cabinet, everything just oh my off gosh. the wall. I was like, this is wild week. I need to get out of Minneapolis <laughs> Yeah, that's all we needed oh, that day. No, no, that was fun, man. No. That's not how you want to leave the Airbnb. No, no, no. Sink ripped off the wall. No, not at all. No, <laughs> it wasn't even like that. No, it wasn't. But that, it, that's it wasn't even like that. All right, last but yeah. not least, number four. What's next for Joey Bird, man? What are you What are you working on? What are you excited about? Um, Anything. I'm excited about just the opportunities that uh, Atlanta provides. Uh it has its own unique basketball culture. Um, Indiana as a state has its basketball court culture, but uh, within the city of Atlanta, there's a lot of talent. And I mean, it's freaking huge. It's such a huge city. So obviously more players, there's going to be more talent. So I'm excited about that. Um, I'm excited about working through some, uh, you know, content strategies that I'm uh, going to be trying to implement and, uh, you know, coming out with some courses, trying to just work through all the details of that and, and understanding, you know, that part of, of the industry, I guess you could say with coaching. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to that and I really, you know, want to produce, you know, content and, uh, and maybe courses, you know, to really help coaches, um, you know, yeah. I think, you know, you can, you know, do stuff that are specific for the player and get players to, you know, uh, want to buy in or whatnot or want to buy it. Um, but, you know, those, you know, at times can be more fluff and, you know, more of the, you know, popular uh, thing. But I want to impact coaches that will go and impact 12, 13, 14, 15 players. And so um, yep. looking forward to uh, doing some of that. And like I said, just, uh, you know, uh, upgrading, I guess you could say, some of my social media strategies to just give a little more yeah. insight into uh, my teaching methods, um, how, I, how I approach workouts, how uh, what goes on inside the workouts. Um, you know, I'm thankful that I've worked with, you know, great players that are good people that um, that are really – serious about their craft. So, uh, it, that all helps with getting results. And, um, because of that, um, you know, like I think, you know, when the tide rises, you know, all the boats rise with it. And, yeah. um, so I've been able to be part of that tide that has ro- risen or a boat that's risen. And so looking forward to sharing some of that with, uh, coaches that, you know, are, are looking to impact, you know, other, their players and, and maybe skill trainers, to impact the players that they work at with and that are in their uh, organization. Yeah. I love it, dude. Well, Joey, man, this has been amazing. It's always great catching up with you and chopping it up. Always. Where, where can my listeners find out more about you? What are the best ways to connect? Yeah, uh, Twitter uh, is, uh, I really share a lot of uh, just coaching insight on Twitter. It's just Joey Burton. Um, that's where you'll see me break down maybe basketball games, uh, certain um, plays that I'm, I'm watching and I observe, coaching thoughts. And Instagram is more just uh, workout related. Uh, that's uh, Coach Joey Burton. And so that's where you'll see me, you know, have workouts. You kind of see who I work out with. Um, you'll see me post, you know, different teaching videos about, you know, things I'm doing within a workout. So those are the two main avenues. And if you ever have a question or, you know, want to reach out, uh, my email is coach Joey Burton at gmail.com and feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, if you have any questions or if there's anything that intrigued you, uh, in this podcast and, you know, I could give you more, uh, in-depth, uh, conversation as well. I love it. Well, Joey, man, thanks again, brother. It was great connecting today. Always, Mike.